Hello there, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Linear Algebra. Um, so we're going to do something pretty different um, this chapter. Well, it's going to start off very different, and then we're going to learn sort of at the end that, in fact, it's not that different from what we've been doing. Um, but we're sort of going to continue the trend that linear algebra seems to, to follow of introducing a bunch of new definitions, and then eventually we're going to learn that all of it is just row reducing. Um, but this is actually going to be very important because this presents a very new way of thinking about matrices that we haven't really talked about yet um, at all and is very, very applicable. So this section, um, I think, um, tends to be uh, very definition heavy. And so on behalf of math and linear algebra, I do apologize. Um, there will be a lot of defini new definitions I'm going to throw at you. Uh, and so I'll, I'll you know, do my best to, to keep everything organized. Um, but I'll just apologize on the outset. There's going to be a lot of new definitions this week. Um, so with that being said, let's jump right in. So first thing I want to define is this idea of a transformation from Rn to Rm. And so remember, this is the set of all vectors Rn is the set of all vectors of length n. Rm is the set of vectors of length m. And one thing, you know, when deciding that we are always going to use the letters n and m, um, you would have thought, you know, they would have maybe think, you know, realized like these these two letters sound way too similar. But anyways, we say that a transformation t from Rn to Rm is a function. And so just like any function you've seen before where it's going to take some element in Rn and send it to an element in Rm. And so in this case, it's mapping each vector in Rn to a vector in Rm. And so whenever I think about functions, I like to think about um, sort of these blobs. And all math can kind of be done with blobs, it turns out. And so here's my blob representing Rn. Of course, it's not drawn to scale because Rn is very much an infinite set, um, but this blob is probably close enough. And so here I've got you know, my vector x living in Rn. So this is just some vector of, of uh, length n. t takes x and maps it to some vector t of x in Rn. And so that's all that's going on. And so you know, I might have, say, another vector Maybe there's another vector w here, and w would get mapped to maybe the same vector, maybe a different vector. We're not sure, but it'll just get mapped to some vector here, t of w. And so all of these vectors sort of just get mapped, follow their path into Rm. So we have a lot of names for um, all of the different things going on here. And so, like I said, I apologize for the not a definition. Some of these you'll actually have probably heard before. Um, some of them might be new. Um, so I'll, I'll state them, and then I want to talk about them a little bit. So we say that the domain of this function, just like the domain, in this case, actually, of um, sort of normally how you would think about it is Rn. So our domain is just the set we are mapping from. So the domain is the set we are mapping from. The range, or sorry, the codomain is the set we are mapping to. And so the codomain here is Rm. So domain, um, you've probably heard for, before, domain is just Rn. Codomain is Rm. If I have some vector x, in Rn, the image of x is just the vector t of x in Rn. So if I have x, the vector that it gets sent to is t of x. All right, so the image of a vector is just the vector that it gets sent to. Right? You can kind of think like it's the, the image. It's a very 
non-discrete way of describing it. But image of x is the vector that x gets sent to. Finally, the range. And this one is maybe the weird, or not the weirdest, but all vectors y in Rm. So the range is all of the vectors in the codomain such that p of x is equal to y for some x in for some x in the domain. All right, so if the codomain is the entire set Rm, the range is the set of vectors in Rm which actually get mapped to. So there's a distinct difference here. This is all of the vectors in Rm is the codomain. The range is just the vectors which actually get mapped to. And so of course the range is a subset of the codomain all the time. Um, but I want to give one quick example of maybe the um, simplest linear transformation, or transformation, sorry, I can think of, which is that t of x equals 0 for all x in Rm. So all this transformation is here is takes every ve vector in Rn and sends it to the 0 vector in Rn. Um, and so why I wanted to give you this example is because here the codomain, by definition, is still Rm. Right? So under this specific example of a linear of a transformation, sorry, I keep saying linear, we're not quite there yet. Under this example of a transformation, the codomain is still Rm, right? It's it's still basically the entire space that we're mapping into. However, the range of this transformation would just be the zero vector. So notice the distinction. Only the zero vector actually gets mapped to under this transformation. But our codomain is still Rm. That is, we're still mapping into the set Rm, even if most of Rm is getting mapped out. All right, so we like linear, we like transformations. I've already given away the punchline. We really like linear transformations. So I'm going to change this definition just a little bit so we can start talking about linear transformations. So we say that a transformation t from Rn to Rm is linear if it's going to satisfy the following two definitions. So transformation from Rn to Rm is linear if we have the following two properties. So t of u plus v for any pair of vectors is equal to t of u plus t of v. So this is to say we can sort of in a way, distribute t across sums. So that if I were to take, I can take the sum basically, the way you can think of this property is like, I can either take the sum before applying t or after applying t and not actually change the value of t. Secondly, if I take any scalar c and multiply it by a vector u, well, I should be able to equivalently multiply that scalar c after applying t of u. Right, so you can also think of this as being able to factor scalars out of the equation. All right, so notice here, this is trivially linear, right? Because every vector in Rn always equals zero. And so everything on the right-hand side of this is just always zero, no matter what I have on the left. Um, so this actually, in fact, is always linear. But there's an even more important type of object which represents a linear transformation. And this is sort of the 
not so secret punchline of, of this lecture, that in fact, and I'll make the claim now, every matrix is a linear transform. Every matrix, every matrix, every matrix is a linear transformation. Um, so I want to spend now sort of the second half of this uh, discussing why, getting an intuition as to how um, we can think about a matrix as a linear transformation and doing some more stuff with it. So I'm going to erase all of this for now so we can start looking at this particular claim. So how can we think of a matrix as a linear transformation? Let's look at a matrix first, look at like a, a sort of definite example, and then I'll expand to the general um, idea of how we're going to do this. So let A We're going to let A be the following matrix, uh, 1, negative 5, 7, negative 3, 7, 5, reading from left to right. And we'll let X just be the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. I think I have missed one here. Three ones. So notice, given the length of X and given the dimensions of A, I can compute A times X. And so if we do this computation, well, here we've got a matrix A, a vector x of length 3, and we can do the vector multiplication dance. And what I get is first entry here should be 1 minus 5 minus 7, which I think is negative 11, and then negative 3 plus 7 plus 5, which I think is 9. And so notice x is in R3, and a of x is a vector in R2. And so notice, furthermore, that I could have chosen any vector x in R3, and by the way matrix multiplication works, right? if you think about how many times I do the vector dance, I do it twice for every vector in R3, because A has two rows. In fact, this is true of every vector x in R3. So this, this fact is true for all vectors x. And so notice with this matrix A, we define, or we can define, a linear transformation T of A mapping R3 to R2. And so I'll often start to use this shorthand for um, linear transformation from R3 to R2. So I'll briefly uh, read out how this is written. Linear transformation TA from R3 to R2. Uh, just a slightly shorter way of writing that out so we don't have to write the whole sentence out every time. And we're going to define it by, and so what this means is we're sort of defining the rule, T of x for every vector x in R3 is equal to A times x. And so what's going on here is we're defining this linear transformation, and we're saying we're going to take each vector x in R3 and map it to the vector a times x in R2. So if you look at the blobs here of what's going on, we've got vector x in R3. A 
and that's going to a times x in R sub A. And so this is what T sub A is doing. So it's taking the vector x in R3 and sending it to A times x. And notice for every vector x in R3, as we've already shown, A times x is in fact a um, vector in R2. All right, so is this transformation really linear? Linear, you might ask. Well, indeed it is, right? So T is linear because, well, remember the two things T had to satisfy, right? It had to split up across sums or distribute across sums, and we should be able to factor out scalars. Here's where I can sort of call my matrix knowledge back. And notice that A times V plus V is equal to a times u plus a times v. And of course, this is true about every matrix A, not just the matrix in this example. And a times c times u is equal to c times a times u. And so sure enough, this is a linear transformation. So this is how we can take any matrix A and think about it as a linear transformation. And so I'll write the um, sort of more general facts up on the board now um, that we can in fact do this with any M by N matrix, not just this example here. I just wanted to use this example to sort of get an idea for how this was actually going to work. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase here. Um, I'm going to leave the example up because I want to finish with one, um, one more example that shows that in fact we haven't really introduce too much new in terms of like, well, you'll see. In fact, if A is an M by N, M by N matrix, Then P sub A mapping Rn to Rm defined by P sub A sub X equals A times X is a linear. So that's really cool. Um, in fact, as we'll see moving forward, this is really, really, really big. Um, that we can think of matrices as linear transformations in this way. All right. So what are some other things we, we've talked about in regards to linear transformations thus far? Um, so we've talked about linear transformations. We've also talked about ranges, codomains, domains, all those old definitions that I, I've since erased. And if you remember working with functions, like every, every time we're working with a function in math, one of the first questions always asked about that function is, what is its range, right? And so it turns out finding the range for, well, we'll talk about finding the range in general, I think a little later in the course, but determining whether a vector is in the range of a particular linear transformation defined in this way. So if we let T of A be a linear transformation defined by matrix multiplication like this, we can actually determine whether a vector is in the range uh, in a fairly straightforward way. So I want to do one last example with this same matrix A. So we're going to let A be this matrix and we want to determine if this vector, B equals negative 2, negative 2, is in the range of T of A. 
where here T of A is defined again in this way. So it's a linear transformation defined by matrix multiplication. So how do we do this? Well, so notice if B is in the range of T of A, right? So if B is in the range, then there is some X such that T sub A of X is equal to B, right? And so notice here in particular, this X is in R3. But how do we define you how did we define T sub A? Well, remember we defined T sub A as matrix multiplication. And so asking if vector B is in the range of T sub A is actually just asking, does this matrix equation AX equals B have a solution? So all this is asking us to do is solve the matrix equation AX equals B. And so like I said, we're not introducing really, I mean, like, you know, technique wise, we know how to do this, um, or at least for a couple sections now we've, we've known how to do this. Um, we're just introducing a new way of asking, I guess, the same question we've been asking. And so how do we determine if AX equals B has a solution? Well, remember for this, we just set up the augmented matrix. And we row reduce. Um, and what I'll do, uh, since this video is starting to get a little long, um, I will put my full row reduction steps in the uh, worksheet solutions corresponding to this problem. So if you want to check the steps here for this row reduction, um, probably good to check my work. Like I said, I have like a 90, 95% success rate doing arithmetic. And so you know, um, you can check the work here. Uh, this is a fairly standard row reduction as far as row reductions go. Um, upon reducing this, I got the following matrix. And so notice in particular, this matrix corresponds to a system of equations that does have a solution. Um, so here, x3 is a free variable. x1 and x2 are not free variables. But so if we were to let um, x3 be equal to 1, this would correspond to the following solution vector. And so you can check a times x should be equal to b. Um, and notice in, in particular, actually, because there is a free variable here, um, well, so I'll briefly explain. So remember, this is x1 equals negative 3x3. Oh, what the heck, I'll just write it out. So remember, this augmented matrix corresponds to x1 minus 3x3 is equal to 3, and x2 plus 2x3 is equal to 1, where here, each of these values corresponds to the corresponding index entry in our solution vector. Um, and so I'm just going to pick x3 to be 1 and then solve for x2 and x1, and that's how I got that. But notice because x3 was free, in fact, um, I could have found infinitely many vectors uh, such that the image of x was equal to b. And so notice here in particular, the image of x is equal to b. We're going back to some of those definitions. So. Linear transformations as matrices. Uh, we will talk more about this in uh, the next video for this section. And I'll see you all then.